just to give sort of a really quick intro here. My name is Harrison. Um, I'm with Third Republic. Elephant in the room, we are recruiters. Um, but on the good side, we're not a company selling you something. So we we try to create this sort of platform called Code Republic as a meetup group that would really discuss, you know, sort of purely from educational standpoint, technology, exciting developments in sort of the tech space and give people sort of a, a no frills platform to talk about things that they find interesting, that they want to kind of share with the world. Come join, see what we have to talk about and kind of go on from there and meet people in your industry who are, you know, interested in the same things you are. Really without any further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Travis, who is going to be the first one speaking here. Um, and then Neil, um, I'll let them just give a quick introduction on themselves if they want and then kick things off. What's going on everybody? Uh, my name is Travis and I like Rust. So today I have a talk prepared for you. Um, I'm going to introduce you to Rust. The goal of the talk is to kind of sell you on the value proposition of the programming language and get you on board the Rust hype train while at the same time, like telling you what you need to know to decide if it's something that you can even use. And then finally, we are going to get into a little bit of code to see the advantages of Rust. And I hope that that gives you a sort of sense of what the programming experience with the language is like. So let's start with some context. What is this thing? Why should you even be interested in? So Rust is the most loved language for five years in a row, according to Stack Overflow's developer survey. You can see it up here, number one. That's measured by the number of developers who are using it, who plan to keep using it. And it's number one by a wide margin. So there's, there's your hook. So about the, the language, Rust was designed by Mozilla in 2010. Um, they make the Firefox web browser, so they really need a language that performs well so that your pages render fast, as well as a language with safety guarantees. Um, this is important just so that the browser doesn't crash, as well as so that they can have security guarantees, there's a lot of passwords and so on going through your browser. And those are requirements that almost all programs have. Um, if you have to use a basis of comparison, you can compare the language to something like C++. It's a systems programming language, so you can kind of write anything with it. It's the first systems programming language since like 1980, that's when C++ was invented, that has this kind of traction, and in my opinion, it's about time. It's a compiled language, um, and there's no garbage collector. That means that it's faster, but it also means that you can use it for more things. Um, you can deploy it to you know, your robot or your smart light bulb. Um, you can write an operating system in it and you can write libraries with it that you can call from other code, um, other programming languages. So maximum flexibility, really good performance. Something it has on top of C++ is really modern tooling, including a modern package manager. When you're using Rust, adding a dependency to some external libraries is as easy as like writing the name of the dependency and the version into a file. This is about more than ease of use. Um, when your language doesn't have a good package manager, like the ecosystem devolves around that. So in the example of C++, you end up with these like very large monolithic libraries like Boost and GTK. Um, and the reason they're so large is because people don't want to go through the hassle of pulling in more than one dependency if they don't have to. But what ends up happening is you pull in way more code that you need. That means that your compile times are going to be much longer than you needed them to be. And it also makes it really hard to review your code from like a security perspective. Finally, the thing that I most love about Rust and what we're going to talk about here is the compile time guarantees that it gives you. Rust is something that you can compare to C++ in that it's a systems programming language, but a lot of the programming language features that it has um, rival some of the more high level, high level languages like Go, C Sharp, and those are the ones that we're going to be talking about. Finally, before we move on into the code section where we look at language features, this is the part where I let you know if you can actually use it or not, depending on what you're doing with it. So if you're going to try to write a web server, uh, Rust is great. Any kind of backend service, um, the performance is great. The tooling is great. I have experience doing this. The Rust community likes to get these domains like are we web yet, which describes the state of using Rust for web related programming. So here's another one, are we learning yet? The answer here is, is no. If you're trying to do machine learning, uh, I don't recommend Rust. The libraries are like still works in progress. You're probably better using something like Python for that. If you're writing a GUI, the answer is sort of. Um, I've seen people write some nice GUIs in Rust, but they're just using bindings to existing frameworks that live in C or C++. If you're writing a game, some good libraries exist for like the major pieces like rendering, physics, networking, but you're gonna have to find a way to put it all together on your own. There's no like frameworks worked out yet. 
if you're writing an operating system, you're not the kind of person who waits around for libraries. You kind of write everything yourself. So sure, go for it. There are some um, open source operating systems being written in Rust. Embedded systems, I mentioned this before, things like smart light bulbs and robots, um, go for it. This is something that Rust has been explicitly supporting more and more recently. And another thing in that category is actually front end development. It's not going to replace all the JavaScript in your browser, but you can compile Rust to WebAssembly. You can call it from JavaScript. You can distribute it via Node Package Manager, and you can learn more about um, that on Rust's website. Now I want to get into the language features, and we're going to be looking at examples of a few programs um, that explain Rust's features and compare these situations to other languages to show that Rust helps you write code with no bugs. If you're squeamish about seeing code on the screen, you have about 30 seconds to get over that. The two features that we're going to talk about today are enums. You'd think they're a really simple feature, but Rust is a language that just really nails simple features. And the second one is called ownership. Ownership is Rust's like flagship feature. It's what helps Rust manage your memory for you, making sure that it creates the objects and gets rid of them at the right times without you having to worry about the C style things where you forget to release something and then you've got a memory leak or you release it and then you try to use it and you have undefined behavior or you free it twice and the list goes on. All right, so let's start off with enums. Here we've got a simple Rust program that we're going to be building up over the next few slides. We're going to start with this enum called animal. An enum is, as you may know, a data type which takes on one of a few values. In this case, an animal can either be a person or it can be a dog. Here's a simple function that generates a random animal. It looks for a random number generator using this random library that we pulled in. And based on the number, it just picks either a person or a dog. Now in our main function, we're gonna match on that. So we generate a random animal and we use this match keyword to introduce this match block where we just list out the different cases of what that animal could be and what we're gonna do about it. In this case, we're just gonna print them out. Something that happens a lot of times in programs is a new case will come up as something that's coming out of a function. Maybe it's literally like a, just a new type of object that it might have to handle. Maybe it's some new error condition um, because in Rust you use enums for error conditions a lot. So we're gonna add this new bird variant to our animal and also update our random animal function. And what happens is if you try to build this program right now, the match will actually complain because you didn't handle this case. And this is a great feature. This means that if you add a new situation, like you can be sure that the program is going to handle that situation properly all the time before it builds. And if you add the case for that, the error goes away. And if you don't like that, you can always add a default case and you won't get the exhaustive matching. Let's look at the same code written in Go to, for a basis comparison. Go is kind of no contest here. Go is too cool for enums. So instead, the closest thing we have is this like const iota um, type deal. It's basically syntax for making some constants that are increasing integers. So person would be assigned to zero, dog would be assigned to one, bird would be assigned to two. And then we just use those integers in lieu of any kind of formal enum. Our random animal function literally just returns an int. It's just a number. There's no like special, um, description of a value that could be one of a few things. And so when we go to match on it, if you're forgetting a case, it's not going to catch that. You get no error, no warning, and you never know. And because Go just uses ints, like it could never add that feature. It's not like Go is going to like add some new feature next year and then everything's going to be solved because, uh, because there's no way to like, you'd never expect someone to match on every possible integer ever. Okay, one more time, we're gonna look at it in C-sharp. Uh, enum looks very similar, person, dog, or bird. Again, function that randomly generates one. We do have enums in C-sharp, so it returns an actual animal. But like Go, when we um, try to match all the possible cases, if we're forgetting one, no error, no warning. This is something that C++ actually gets right. So very similar C++, they're all like C-inspired languages. Again, animal, generate it. Try to match on it. If you're forgetting a case, the compiler will give you this warning. It's saying you didn't handle this one particular value. So, so far I'm, I'm calling this a loss for Go in C Sharp. And so far C++ is holding up. So let's introduce one more, fun, um, one more feature of Rust enums that C++ does not keep up with. So here's our Rust code again. 
In Rust, you can do this thing where here we've introduced a struct for a bird and birds have a wingspan. Dogs and people do not have wingspans. And on our enum, we can add this data to only one variant of the enum. So it's data that you can only look at if the animal was actually a bird. So the way that we actually look at that data is only when we match that bird case, we get to like pick a name for what that data is going to be. And then we can just look at its wingspan and in this case, print it out. If you try to do that with a different variant, it kind of right away looks wrong to you and to anyone who has experience programming in Rust. Um, and of course you're going to get an error. It basically says like, that's not a thing and you can't do that. The closest thing that you can get to this in C++ is a sort of hand rolled, what you'd call a tagged union. It's um, you have an enum that describes the different types that you can have. You have data structures for all of them. In this case, it just left two of them empty. And then you kind of package those together into one package with the enum that says which type it is. And then this other thing, um, it's new in C++ 17, I guess it's kind of new, um, called standard variant, where it just stores a thing of one of the three types that you put in it. But when you're using it, you just have to like try to make sure that you don't access um, the thing as the wrong type when the enum says it was a different type. And so if you try to access the wingspan of a dog, you will get a dog wingspan. Um, in this case, your program will actually crash. If you want to avoid this, you're going to have to write tests. You're going to have to hope that you write them correctly. You're going to have to run them when you run your continuous integration and it's going to be a bad time. So that wraps up the enum section. I hope that demonstrates how like a simple feature helps you prevent bugs in a way where in other languages, it's not like you can write a library for that. Like it's very much a language intrinsic compiler intrinsic feature that helps to prevent bugs that way. All right, now we're going to get on to the second feature that I want to explain today. This is called ownership um, and it's kind of central to Rust. It's a little trickier. So we're going to start with an intro to it. And then we're going to look at a bug that actually did happen when I was working at the world's largest hedge fund that took out our trading systems for a few minutes, which is really bad, and how this feature would prevent that bug from happening. So ownership. In Rust, all your data has an owner, and that owner is either a function, like the, like the memory in the stack frame for the function, or it is some other data. So here we're going to have a struct. I called it string owner because it owns the string that's inside. All structs own the, all of the fields that are inside, generally. What we're going to do is we're going to make a string and then we're going to make a string owner providing that string as that owned field. If we try to use the string after this, even just to print it, we get this error. The error says you can't use that because you don't own it anymore. You can only have one owner. So when I put that string in that struct, like the struct owns the string now and I don't, so I'm not allowed to use it. And so the error tells me which thing I moved, like where I moved it, when I tried to use it again, it's pretty helpful. The most simple solution to this is you just put a copy of the string in there and then you still retain ownership over the original one. Um, and there's a similar setup with functions. If you just take a parameter by value like this, uh, again, we're gonna make a string and we're just gonna call this function with the string. And then you try to use it afterwards. When you call that function, you handed ownership of your variable over to that function. And so you're not allowed to use it anymore. If you wanna get around it, again, you can make a copy. If you don't wanna make a copy, um, there's an equivalent for the struct situation with this too. You can do what's called borrowing. When you pass it by reference, if you're familiar with C++, it's something like that. The function that you're calling will take ownership, but only until it's done. And when it's done, um, you will get ownership back. So it borrowed it, it had ownership for a short time. All right, with that under our belts, we're gonna get into this tricky bug. The bug happens when you do some bad things with a hash set. So. A hash set is a data structure. It stores things. It has good lookup properties, basically how it works. Um, some of you probably find this boring, but some of you maybe don't know how it works. So here we go. Is when you want to take a value and you put it in your hash map, you hash it, it maps it to some integer. That integer tells you where in the hash map that thing is going to live so that you can quickly find it again if you want to go looking for it. And then you just store it in the hash map. The TLDR is that you don't want to change it once you do this. Because its location is chosen based on its value, if you change its value without actually moving it inside the structure, then when you go looking for it again, you're gonna go looking in the wrong place. 
And if you go looking for the old value, you're gonna look in the right place, but you're not gonna find what you're looking for because it's changed since then. Basically, this thing just disappears. And if you were assuming that it's still in there, you're gonna have a bad time. Um, and that's exactly what happened at the hedge fund. Basically, someone wrote some very reasonable looking code that just like put something in, changed it, and then assumed that it would be there again. And when it didn't find it, it crashed the program. Our most clever, most respected, probably highest paid engineer Took him a couple days to really track down what was going on here. This kind of thing is very hard to find. So let's look at how Rust prevents this from happening. And then let's just kind of see it in action in some other languages to drive the point home. All right, so the setup is we're going to have this struct value. It's just going to have a number inside. That's the i32. We're going to add that um, derived tag on the struct that just like implements a hash function for us so that the hash set is good to go. Then we're going to make a new hash set in our main function. And we're going to grab a reference to our value. We're going to add it into the hash set, and then we're going to change it. That's exactly what triggers the bug. And then we're just going to look in the hash set for the old value and for the new value, and we're going to see if either of them are there. So in Rust, we get a compiler error. It says this is a bad time. You're not allowed to change the thing because you gave it to the hash set. Even if you just gave the hash set a reference to it, you're still not allowed to change it because it's a little bit more complicated than just you have exactly one owner. You could have multiple borrowers that are allowed to read the value, but only one borrower that's allowed to write the value, including the owner. So if I'm allowed to write the value, then no one else can see it at the same time. Like that's the check that's going on. And since the hash set can see it, I'm not allowed to write it. This is the same code written in C Sharp. Um, again, we have a class for the value. We make a hash set, we make a value add it in there, and then we change its inside so that its hash value would change. We would check if the old or new one is there. Neither of them are there. That's the bug. Let's check in with Go. Um, Go is too cool for enums. It's also too cool for hash sets. So instead, we use a map, which maps the value to an empty struct. In any case, it's the same thing. Make the set, make the value, add the value to the set, change the inside to the value, check if it contains it. Again, neither of them contain it. and. In case you didn't get the message, I mean, the, the point, the same thing happens in C++. We're using the standard unordered set, which is their hash set. All the same things apply, it doesn't show up. And so this is a feature which, um, which is intrinsic to Rust. It's, it's built into Rust at every layer. It's sometimes annoying because you're working with it, but you kind of trust it that it's going to prevent bugs. And if you have like heard of bugs like this before, Maybe you're, you should be impressed. Like it's kind of cool that a language feature can prevent a bug like this. And if you haven't heard of bugs like this before, your takeaway should be like, there are some very tricky bugs that you haven't heard about and coding with Rust is going to prevent them from ever happening to you. So that's all the code. In conclusion, I would say that you should prefer Rust over C++ um, for its tooling and for its language features. You should prefer it over even some modern high level languages again, for its language features, because they're still very good, and for its performance and flexibility, because it's not garbage collected. You shouldn't use it if it's missing libraries you need. Um, the flip side of this is if you're looking for a hobby or a side project, the Rust ecosystem is kind of nascent. Like there's a great a world of opportunity for you to make some new game engine or some new, um, some new implementation of something that would be like the safest, fastest implementation of that thing ever. This is happening across the board. I use a terminal called Alacrity. It's really fast. It's written in Rust. People are writing shells in Rust. People are rewriting like the Unix command line tools like grep in Rust, and they're good and they're faster. People are writing like the fastest web servers in Rust, and they're also safe. And people are writing crypto in Rust, especially after OpenSSL's like heart bleed bug that affected like everybody. That is exactly the kind of memory safety bug that Rust is designed to avoid. So uh, people are moving away from that. And the second caveat is that you shouldn't use Rust if you need to hire people quickly for your company. Um, Rust is a tricky language to learn. Um, I've used it for a year and I'm still learning things. By contrast, a language like Go, I started working at Mad High, we use Go. Um, and by like day two, I was up and running with it, even doing like concurrency related things. It took me all of 20 minutes to explain some of the most basic features of Rust that you'd interact with all the time. And as you're going to see in Neil's talk later, the amount of things that you can explain about Go in 20 minutes includes like cancellation and concurrency and synchronization and getting to those things in Rust, like I'm still reading things and reading guides to, to get myself up and, go, and running on that. But um, 
yeah, Rust overall as language is a thing that you could write anything in. It's just that a lot of the libraries are still emerging. And if you don't want to write them yourself, maybe it's not ready for you yet. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Travis. Um, cool. So we're going to pass it over now to Neil, who's going to run through Go and sort of his experience. So uh, I am here to tell you about Go, uh, like Travis is trying to sell you on Rust. I'll try to sell you on Go, uh, even though it is too cool for enums and hash maps. So I I'll just say right off the bat, if you like to do error checking, Go is definitely the language for you, uh, even without hearing the rest of this presentation. If you don't like error checking, uh, you might want to stick around. So uh, this presentation, I'll kind of go over uh, what I think is so great about Rust, kind of what workloads it's ready for, like Travis went over. Uh, we'll go through, through some of the interesting language features, uh, and then we'll kind of compare similar functionality in other languages to um, kind of uh, drive home the point uh, about how right Go gets certain things. So just a quick history of Go. Um, it was released by Google in 2012. Um, it is a statically typed, compiled, garbage collected language. As of somewhat recently, it has package management uh, via Go modules. Um, like Rust, it also makes it extremely easy to pull down your dependencies and version them. Um, its primary focus is to simplify development on um, you know, multi-core network machines uh, and you know, in sort of distributed systems and environments, um, which Google does a lot of. If you're familiar with C, Go is syntactically similar to C. Uh, you wouldn't need to spend much time to learn how to write Go if you know C. Um, if you're not familiar with C, I envy you. And lastly, it is, it is a modern language. Uh, it has modern tooling, good testing, benchmark frameworks. Um, it has excellent build time uh, and you know built-in build tooling. And lastly, unlike Rust, um, it's easy to learn and it's easy to hire developers for. Um, so if you uh, are looking to hire people, um, that alone is a good reason to use Go instead of Rust. Uh, but hopefully I'll convince you that there are at least a few more reasons. So just a quick rundown of uh, the things that Go is ready for. Web servers, if you know anything about Go, absolutely Go is ready for web servers. Um, it is what it was built for. Um, it is makes writing clients and servers super easy. Um, and, you know, we'll talk later about how it, easy it makes concurrency. Um, machine learning. Yes, you can do machine learning in Go. There are TensorFlow libraries uh, and there are a couple of open source projects that do uh, matrix arithmetic uh, and things of the like for machine learning as well. For GUIs, kind of like Rust, uh, sure, you could write a GUI in Go. Uh, oftentimes, these will use C Go bindings to existing GUI toolkits, um, which is a bit, you know, kind of cheating in some sense, but it is, it is completely doable. Maybe not the first choice, um, but not impossible. In a similar vein, games, uh, you could certainly write a game in Go. Um, I've got a link over here to uh, Gen, which is a, a 3D game engine that uses OpenGL. Uh, there are a number of other open source projects uh, for, you know, 2D and 3D game engines. So you could definitely write a game in Go if you were so inclined. Operating system, uh, I would say not really. Um, it, Go has a, a number of impediments to, you know, running in, in uh, Ring Zero as an operating system. Uh, it's something that people are working on, but um, it's kind of, you know, an experimental projects and definitely not the best language uh, for the task at hand. Embedded systems, something I recently learned, Tiny Go, uh, there's a Go compiler. You can run your Go code on uh, embedded devices as small as Arduino. So this is completely possible if it's something you want to do. Uh, lastly, this is not a workload, but I felt it had to be mentioned at least once. Is Go ready for generics? The answer is not yet. There's a blog post over here on the right. Uh, there is a proposal for generics that um, is in the works, and the best case scenario is that we see it in Go 117 uh, sometime in August 2021. So if you love generics and you can't do without them, Go is not the language for you, at least not yet. No. So now we'll kind of dive into, you know, some of the language features. So, you know, what does Go help you do? And if you know anything about Go, uh, the answer to that is, is concurrency and synchronization. 
um, it makes it extremely easy to write concurrent code and synchronize concurrent code. Now I will take a look at exactly how that is. So the first language feature, which uh, you know is kind of a flagship feature of Go, is Go routines, um, and these are lightweight threads, uh, sometimes called green threads, meaning they aren't operating system threads. They're scheduled by the Go runtime, and they do run on operating system threads, uh, but you don't manage them explicitly. As a point of trivia, uh, everything is a Go routine, including your main function in a Go binary. Um, so, you know, the syntax, uh, it's dead simple. Uh, so a Go routine, um, you launch a Go routine by preceding a function call with Go, um, just the keyword Go, as you would call a regular function. Um, it will run concurrently with all other Go routines, including, again, your implicit main Go routine. So in this example over here on the right, we uh, have essentially emulated a game of Duck, Duck, uh, duck, duck Goose. Um, so we start in main, uh, and the first thing we do is we launch our Goose Go routine. So uh, that every two to 12 seconds, we'll print out Goose. So we launch this Go routine, um, and it you know exists in the Go runtime, and the schedule will schedule it. Uh, and then we continue on in our main Go routine, and we run this infinite for loop where we print Duck every second. Uh, so if you were to run this, you know, you get a sort of a random game of duck, duck, goose, which is enabled by the concurrency that, that the Go scheduler is doing for you. Now, another comparison with uh, operating system threads, Go, Go routines are extremely lightweight. Um, creating an operating system thread incurs a call to the operating system, and they will typically have, say, a megabyte as their stack size. Um, you might think twice before creating, uh, you know, a thousand operating system threads, uh, but uh, Go routines will have a stack size of uh, two kilobytes to start, um, and it might never expand. They are managed by the runtime. They require no call to the operating system, um, and thousands of Go routines is, you know, completely possible and done in tons of systems. So now, as soon as you begin working with, uh, you know, sort of concurrent code using Go routines, uh, you will inevitably need to synchronize execution between them. Uh, and the Go standard library has, uh, you know, some great synchronization primitives that make this pretty easy. Um, this example on the right is sort of an, uh, is, is an example of a, a fan out uh, for an IO bound task. So we start, we have, you know, our, our slice of files, uh, three different file names. Uh, and the primitive that we use to, to synchronize the Go routines that we'll create is a wait group. So we create a wait group. Uh, we add the number of files because that's how many Go routines we'll have. And then for each file, we spawn a Go routine. We say, when you're done, uh, call wait group done. Uh, it'll read a file, write it to standard out, and then it will return. And so this uh, Go routine, or sorry, these Go routines will all run concurrently while our main Go routine waits for them to do uh, their IO bound task. You know, in this example, it is reading a file. These could just as easily be uh, a number of web requests that you would like to send out and process concurrently. Now, um, again, once you start working with concurrent code, you likely want to communicate between code that is running concurrently. Uh, and that is achieved with uh, Go's feature of channels. So here's an example, and you can essentially think of uh, a channel, you know, as a pipe through which you can send data that is safe to be concurrently accessed uh, by multiple Go routines. So uh, they can be used for a, a whole slew of things, uh, but one of those things is for synchronization. Uh, and this example on the right kind of uh, demonstrates, you know, a trivial example of this synchronization, and this emulates a, a game of ping pong. Uh, so we create two channels. Uh, so these are sort of two pipes. Uh, you can think of them as the channel in which the player will receive the ball. At the bottom here, we define our function. Uh, this is essentially a player playing the game. Um, so what they do is they receive the ball, they hit it, make a sound effect, uh, and then they write the ball to their opponent's channel. And so in main, we spin up uh, a go routine for each of the two players, and then we put a ball into the game by writing to our channel, uh, and then we sleep for one second to let them do their thing. 
And so if you were to run this, you see ping and pong uh, printing alternatively. So um, no Go routine will run more than once a row because we are using channels here to synchronize them. Now, I know I'm supposed to be selling you on Go, but lest you think that everything is um, easy and trivial, uh, channels still need some thought and they can still cause deadlock. This slide right here um, is exactly the same as the previous slide, except I have written to the P1 channel twice right here. Now channels, like I said, you can think of them as a pipe um, and they are by default, they block on reads and writes. So if you write, you will sit there until somebody reads what you have written. Uh, and if you read, you will sit there until there is something to read. Um, so what happens here is that uh, we put two balls into play uh, and ultimately both players will be blocked trying to write to each other's channel uh, and we get some deadlock. So again, Go makes concurrency easy. It doesn't make it foolproof. Some other uh, essential functionality that you can implement with channels is cancellation. Um, in distributed systems, uh, client server architectures, you almost always will encounter situations where a request is initiated and processing begins. Uh, and then at some point something happens and you realize that you no longer care about the result of that processing. So this code on the right uh, kind of shows from first principles how you would implement cancellation in Go. Um, essentially, we write a function at the bottom here, which takes a channel it runs an infinite for loop within that uh, we have a select statement um, and select statements are essentially like switch statements, except they can switch on a number of channels and they will run whichever case corresponds to a channel that has readable data. Um, similarly to switch statements, they support a default case. So up here in main, we create our cancel channel, which we use to signal cancellation. Uh, we run our count until canceled function, we give it our channel, uh, so it knows, you know, it has a, a, a channel to read and know when it was canceled. We sleep for a second and then we cancel it. Uh, so this will essentially terminate the background Go routine that we wrote. So uh, this, again, is sort of from first principles and is, is pretty neat, um, but what is even better than this is Go's context library. Um, so Go has a, a context package, which essentially wraps um, cancellation and timeout functionality in a standard interface and lets you pass that across, uh, you know, API boundaries and do checks, you know, as needed. So this is both formalized in the language and is also something that is baked into nearly all of the client and server libraries that are written in Go. Um, you know, HTTP, server and client support a context, gRPC. Um, and again, this is kind of an, an essential thing for ensuring that you don't uh, have long running operations that are wasting resources that uh, nobody will ever really care about. So on the right, we have what is essentially the previous example, but instead of using a, a channel, it is using a context to carry this cancellation information. Um, and another small change is that this gets a little fancier and it doesn't cancel the context directly. Uh, it creates a context with a timeout. So in line, you know, line one of main, we create a context that has a timeout of one second. We start our function, which takes that context and runs so long as uh, it is not timed out. And then it sleeps for two seconds in main. And so the neat thing about this is that we don't actually have to call an explicit cancellation from our main Go routine. The context handles this entirely for us and it will cancel our Go routine after one second because that's its timeout. So uh, we've kind of looked at, you know, pretty quickly how uh, Go allows you to write concurrent code um, and, you know, hopefully it kind of demonstrates that it, it's simple and, and straightforward for the most part. Um, but to really drive the point home, uh, I'm going to compare kind of how Go achieves concurrency with how this is done in other languages. And um, this is often done with uh, an async await paradigm, which, let's see. So async await um, is, you know, used in C sharp, um, Java, Rust, and it is essentially a paradigm for indicating that uh, certain bits of code may run concurrently. 
So in these languages, you typically have to mark a function as async explicitly, and that means that the function may yield its, uh, you know, thread of execution at some point. Um, and within that async function, you use the await keyword to indicate that you would like to uh, yield your execution uh, awaiting the result of another asynchronous operation. So in, in these languages, it's worth noting, you can write an async function that doesn't call a wait, um, but it is essentially a synchronous function. And that's what we have over here on the right. So this function is called async, or uh, rather it is annotated as being asynchronous, uh, but it never calls a wait. And in C sharp, you'll actually get a compiler warning for this. Um, up here, we have what is actually an asynchronous function. So uh, without getting into too much detail, this is usually achieved through um, the compiler splitting your function uh, into multiple fragments around these awaits, uh, generates a, a state machine that essentially acts as a stack frame for your function. Uh, and this allows pausing and resuming execution at, later, uh, at a later time. Uh, so all of that is to kind of say that there is, there is some overhead to, to doing this. And not only is there overhead, uh, there are kind of some constraints that make this even more painful. And that is that uh, asynchronous functions may only be called generally by other asynchronous functions. Um, so now whenever you create a function, depending on what it's doing, you have to make this decision uh, whether or not it should be synchronous or asynchronous. Now that alone isn't terribly problematic, but uh, once you begin working with library interfaces uh, and functions, at, as uh, first class objects, uh, this can definitely put you in some, some hairy situations in which you kind of hate the authors of the libraries that you're using. So we'll kind of go over uh, exactly what those annoyances are. Um, so here's a, a Rust example uh, where we use async. Uh, actually, we don't use async in, in this function, um, but this, this is sort of just demonstrating uh, first class functions, where at the bottom here we have a, an apply function, which takes a predicate function as an argument and a source vector. It applies that predicate on the source vector uh, and, you know, prints the output. Um, so this is pretty straightforward. Now, if I want to support um, an asynchronous function predicate being called, uh, I will need to declare that my apply function is asynchronous. Now, you know, that's all right, but again, it means now my apply function can only be called uh, from other asynchronous code uh, unless they want to sort of jump through the hoops needed to, to call it from synchronous code. Um, and so you can see the sort of changes that has, have to happen here. Um, now, if I want to call uh, asynchronous code from synchronous code, I kind of have this, this, um, these hoops that I described earlier, where I need to sort of indicate that, you know, I'm, I'm a synchronous function and I'm calling an asynchronous function. Um, and this incurs sort of a nested async runtime, which again is, is additional overhead for, you know, whatever I'm trying to run. Uh, this is an example in, in C sharp. Uh, I won't go into it too much, but uh, at the bottom here, you see the same thing where we, need to kind of jump through some hoops to call um, an asynchronous function from our uh, synchronous function, which takes uh, a predicate function as an argument. So, uh, you know, hopefully this kind of demonstrates how async await can, can cause some difficulties during development. Um, but, you know, uh, well, th these are essentially the, the decisions you have to make if you are writing a library interface. Um, you know, if you are writing functions which are inherently synchronous, um, you know, you're kind of fine. You can write them as synchronous um, and that's okay. If they're not truly synchronous, you need to, uh, you know, use it in like the example of Rust, uh, nested runtimes to uh, sort of pretend that your synchronous function is asynchronous. If you make your exported functions asynchronous, now they can only be used by other asynchronous code, uh, unless that code jumps through the um, hoops of, you know, creating a nested runtime and running your asynchronous function. So that, that's kind of the, the pain that you have to deal with uh, in other languages. And now to loop back to Go, 
um, on the right, we kind of have a, a simple example of a function as a first class argument. Um, so at the bottom, we have this apply function, which again takes a predicate. Um, and that predicate uh, in this case is this double function, which doubles our arguments. Um, so we iterate through our slice and we double everything. Now, what if we want uh, this function that we call to potentially be something asynchronous? Is there anything special that you have to do? Um, and the answer is no, there's absolutely nothing that you have to do. And that is because um, at the lowest level, the go runtime has essentially uh, removed the distinction between synchronous and asynchronous code. Um, and so this example here, uh, much like the previous example, uh, takes a predicate function, but instead of doing something that we know is synchronous, like doubling a number, uh, we will call this lookup function, which um, you know has some pseudocode. It reads from a database. Now this is likely to incur uh, a network call and probably block on some IO until we get a result. Um, so this is an asynchronous function uh, by nature, uh, but there is absolutely nothing that needs to be done to indicate to the Go compiler, uh, or even in your code to indicate that this is an asynchronous function uh, and it may yield execution. Now, this is actually pervasive enough in Go that essentially all of the standard library functions, which um, say, you know, make syscalls to read files um, are inherently asynchronous and they themselves may uh, yield execution to other Go routines um, while they are waiting for this, their results. And essentially all of this happens transparently to you. Um, you have to make virtually no considerations about, you know, what is or is not asynchronous and when it may or may not yield its execution uh, to allow something else to run. Uh, and interestingly, uh, it's not just your main function that gets a Go routine when your binary starts. The garbage collector and the Go scheduler themselves are run as Go routines. Um, so again, it is essentially all Go routines um, all the way down. In conclusion, if you are writing concurrent code, you're writing web servers, um, you need to do stream processing, uh, Go, it's really hard to beat the ease of use around its concurrency features. Um, it won't stop you from making mistakes necessarily uh, in the way that maybe a language like Rust will, uh, but there's, a, there's very little barrier to entry. And you know, like Travis said, in, in a couple of days, you can kind of be up and running and writing uh, concurrent code uh, without having to learn you know, much beyond say standard uh, C syntax which I guess is the next bullet point, it's easy to learn. Um, it's, it's a lot like C, um, it, you know, it doesn't have a lot of language gotchas. Um, and the concurrency model in Go not only stops you from having to uh, worry about, you know, thinking about your concurrent code to some extent, um, it's also extremely performant in the way that the Go scheduler um, is essentially designed to work um, kind of alongside the operating system schedule, scheduler and get uh, as much performance as possible, essentially not yielding its operating system threads um, uh, as much as it possibly can. Uh, and lastly, it's supported broadly on, on virtually all cloud providers. Um, you know, if you want to write some Go code and you want to be able to run it in the cloud, wherever that may be, uh, it is uh, almost a guarantee that, that Go is a perfectly suitable language for that task. That's pretty much all I've got. I hope you're sold on Go. And uh, I don't know, I guess I will turn this back over to Harrison. Uh, well, first, just want to give a big round of applause to our two speakers. Thank you so much. Uh, it was really great just to hear everything. Great job, guys. I, I, uh, I got one question. Um, so uh, we'll start here. Could the speakers address the approach to object orientation in both languages? So um, I, I guess I'll start that off seeing how Neil just left off. Maybe Neil could go and then Travis can follow up on that. Yeah, so Go is, is not object oriented. Um, if you want to kind of achieve, you know, uh, the similar things that you would in an object oriented program, uh, 
you essentially declare structs and methods on them, which, you know, gets you, I would say 90% of the way there, um, but Go is certainly not an object-oriented language uh, by any means. Rust is also not what you'd call an object-oriented language. Um, if you're interested in things like implementing interfaces, like that's pretty much covered. Um, Rust has something called traits. They're basically interfaces. And But if you're interested in something like one thing inheriting from another thing, um, if you're interested in encapsulation, those are things that you're not going to find. There's a couple of situations in which I actually like Rust's model better than like most standard object-oriented languages. And one of those is the fact that like some data implements some interface or trait in this case is like external to that data. So if I'm using a data type in a library, I can make my own trait and then I can implement that trait for the data type from the other library. Whereas in something like C Sharp or Java, like you would have to make it as part of that type. And if you wanted to add functionality to a type that already existed, you'd have to like wrap it in something else that like calls into it. And, and that's just kind of like an annoyance. So we have another question here. Um, so garbage collection and lack thereof, how do you hire someone who can help us all avoid memory leaks? Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a great question. Sounds like it's for me. <laughs> so um, yeah, since Rust has no garbage collector, um, you immediately start thinking of like C and C++ where you're making these like alloc and free calls and like you got to worry about all that. Rust ownership model handles this for you. you there is no alloc, there is no free. Um, the compiler, based on the way you write your program, will insert those for you in a way that proves that there's no use after free, no double free, etc. So that's where the like memory safety of Rust comes from. Um, that said, like the constraints that Rust puts on you in order to make sure that it knows how to put those things in your code are, if you're not used to it, they can be a lot sometimes. There's, there's like an activity called fighting the borrow checker where you're like, trying to write your code in a way that Rust can figure out how to manage your memory for you. And a lot of people who are used to C or C++ will just be like, I don't want to do this. And they'll open up an unsafe block and they'll just do whatever they want in there. And that like kind of eliminates all the benefits they would have gotten. They followed up saying, actually same question to go. How do you stop memory leaks leading to stop the world operations? Yeah, this is like, I mean, going into like the Go garbage collector is, you know, like probably a whole hour presentation in and of itself. Um, but I think that in general, Go, you know, Go makes it pretty easy uh, both to not leak memory uh, and to not um, allocate and free memory via the garbage collector in a way that you get these sort of stop the world events. I mean, again, the garbage collector is run as a Go routine. It runs concurrently and the scheduler will actually try to, while the garbage collector is running, only schedule other Go routines that will make no heap allocations. Um, and so that's that's sort of like, you know, at least a minor way in which we, we try to still get things done while we are doing uh, garbage collection. Um, but, you know, again, there's, uh, I think, I forget what company, somebody out there has a great article on, on essentially switching from Go to Rust because uh, garbage collection was killing their service. Um, and it kind of comes down to don't store a ton of references to things. For example, storing a reference in a map is a horrible idea and it makes the garbage collector have to do horrible things. These are things that, you know, you, you probably don't realize until they've like wrecked your program, but um, in general, it's, you know, it's kind of easy to avoid these pathological cases, uh, you know, once you've learned what they are. Yes, there we go, Discord. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one more uh, thought on that is that Go actually has this cool optimization where if it knows that your object and the references to it aren't going to like outlive your function or be returned by it or anything like that, it will stack allocate those objects and then clean them up right away. And that reduces the strain on the garbage collector, which just makes things, keeps things running smoother. And uh, we have another question here. Uh, I guess it's gonna be, you know, to, towards Neil, but Travis, if you wanna fill in afterwards, you seem to, you know, I know you work with it a bit too as well. So curious your thoughts on the advantage on Go's threading model versus other languages uh, that have similar things built in to the language's features, parallel for lightweight threads, um, coroutines, et cetera. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll just say quickly, actually, that, you know, I'm, I'm, my, my, the two languages I know best are Go and C, which are kind of, you know, on opposite ends of the spectrum. And that Go, you know, kind of does a lot of lightweight threading and concurrency for you. Um, and if you want to do the same thing in C, uh, you're completely on your own. Um, so I would actually say that I, I don't think I'm in, you know, kind of a great position to compare, uh, you know, Go's implemented, implementation of lightweight threads uh, or coroutines to kind of other systems. I don't know if you, Travis, uh, have any thoughts? Uh, I, yeah, I was doing some research for this talk actually, and I think I have, I can share some answers on this. So in terms of coroutines, like one of the nice things that Go gives you that you can't get from a library that you'd write in like C is that Go will automatically insert the like yield statements or like the await statements that will yield control of the Go routine back to the scheduler to schedule a garbage collection or another Go routine. And with any other language, if you're writing your own library, you're gonna to have to do those yields yourself. And if you don't do them properly, you're gonna have a bad time. I mean, on top of that, like the only other language that I saw that did that, I think was Erlang and like nobody uses Erlang. I'm not sure exactly why, but there's probably a good reason for that. So, you know, aside from that, you're writing a library, you're writing your own yield statements, or I think C Sharp and Rust um, and some other languages maybe have async await. And we saw some of the drawbacks with that. You've got all this like problem I've heard it called like, what color is your function? Like every function has got to be sync or async and like working between those two things is a big hassle. And then I guess going back to, to, to Neil, so or maybe just following up on the, the question around garbage collection. So what, what makes Go's garbage collection more efficient than Java's? I say this because I haven't heard of the kind of complaints that are directed towards maybe Java. Um, I, I don't know that I have like a great answer beyond, for that, like beyond, you know, Travis mentioned kind of a, the, you know, one of the optimizations is, is you know, allocating things on the stack if we, uh, you know, know that uh, that is a fine thing to do and we can clean them up when, when we're done. Um, but I'm actually not really super familiar with the, the drawbacks of Java garbage collection, uh, which is something I'm thankful for uh, to, you know, to say why, why Go excels uh, compared to Java. I've actually heard some horror stories about Java. I think that it's not the garbage collector's fault in Java. Um, yeah, like Go is like a value oriented language. So you can make values by value and then get references if you need them. Again, the compiler has the optimization that elides the like heap allocation if it can. In Java, you don't have custom value types. Every time you make a struct, that's really a class. And every time you make a new one of those, it's always heap allocated. And I think that just puts a lot of strain on it. And I've heard people who, I mean, Scala also uses a JVM, so same garbage collector. They run into what they call GC hell. And it like runs in certain conditions, it never terminates, and they just have to like close their program and reopen it. What are some good resources for people who want to dive deeper into either Rust or Go, um, you know, for sort of side projects or ways to really dive deeper than just sort of like playing around with it? Uh, honestly, Google. Google's pretty good. <laughs> to make a fine search engine like if you i'm sure if you google either one of them there's like there's some like books on rust that exist online that people have written um and they're pretty good i don't think i could do a better job than google for finding you getting started resources yeah i mean so similarly for go um go you know go has great documentation um you know the standard libraries there's tons of open source projects if you're kind of just actively looking for something to contribute to um but yeah, I mean, you know, I'm sure that there, there are probably books on Go, but, um, you know, Google has their tour of Go as well as kind of some more detailed rundowns of, of Go's features. And, um, you know, at least in my mind, those are, those are sort of like the canonical sources and, and at the very least the first place you'd, you'd want to look. Thanks everyone for joining. Again, a huge just round of applause to Travis and Neil. It really was awesome. I think that you guys did a fantastic job. Um, but yeah, really thanks to everyone coming. It was really awesome. Um, like I said, we're going to be trying to put on a few more of these. The idea is purely educational. If you have things you want to talk about, if this inspired you to get involved, please feel free to reach out to myself. Mm -hmm.